I do not. Okay. For you, you're talking about the microphone for the witness? Uh, for the video clips, it seems like when they start, it's very, very loud. And so I was going to ask if oh. we could turn it down a little bit. Um, we could do that, right? Uh, Ms. Robinson, do you know? I don't believe we can. You don't? Okay. I'll, I'll email Ms. McKager and see for sure, okay? Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is back in the courtroom. Before the afternoon break, uh, Ms. Brady was still in her direct examination of uh, Mr. Robert Holmes. Mr. Holmes, I remind you that you're still under oath. And Ms. Brady, you may resume your direct examination. Thank you. Your Honor, can I approach uh, Mr. Holmes with exhibits T-TRD-TR-340 through 355, excluding number 351? Yes, you and may. And while I'm going up there, I would also like to take D-TR-392. Yes. Your Honor, I cannot recall if before the break I'd said this, but I don't have an objection to the admission of these things in their publication. Thank you. Without objection, then D-TR-340 through 355 inclusive, with the exception of D-TR-351 uh, are admitted, and then D-TR-392 is also admitted without objection, and all the uh, exhibits that I just admitted may be published. Mr. Holmes, we were uh, talking before the break about uh, your family would go out and do things as a family. Do you recall that? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, and um, we're going to look at, at some pictures of those things. If we can have 340, please. Can you tell the jury about this picture? Uh, that's, I think, Jimmy and I at the beach. When he was a baby? Yep. Um, which beach would you go to, or would you go to a number of them? There are uh, several different beaches around. Um, this might be Monterey Beach. Um, I'm not quite sure which one, exactly which beach, but we go to a lot of different ones. Okay. Uh, let's look at 343, please. Uh, that's, uh, yes, bowling. Uh, we'd, we did a fair amount of bowling, actually, when we'd go up uh, to Big Bear, um, in the evenings after either snowboarding or um, or during the summer or if we got on the lake uh, in the evenings usually we'd go bowling. Right, and is that uh, James bowling? Yeah, that's Jimmy bowling. Um, if we could look at 344, please. Yes, we uh, did a fair amount of camping, so this is a picture of us on one of our camping trips. So. And who are the three in that picture? Um, that's uh, me on the left, and then Jimmy, and then Chris down in front. 346, please. Um, this is on a golf trip, Tecolote Canyon, which is a small golf course in, in San Diego. So it was right near, near not too far from where we lived. So we and would it, would it be just you and, and Jim, or would it be the whole family? Uh, this is actually probably a whole family trip. Mm -hmm. 352. Yeah, this is one where um, San Diego Zoo has a wild animal park that's outside of San Diego. Um, and so we did a, uh, a Segway tour of the park. So you could uh, rent a Segway and go all around the park. 
driving those. So that's basically all of us. I'm on the left, then Chris, then Arlene, and Jim to the right. 353, please. Um, this one looks like we're at uh, probably Big Bear Lake, um, one of our summer trips. So it looks like we're all getting ready to either, uh, you know, rent jet skis or go out on a, on a boat. 354. Yeah, there's, I, I guess we had a boat uh, in this one, and so it was one where you tow a banana boat thing, and so... Um, that's typically what we do at Big Bear Lake is get out on the water a little bit, did especially you go, in the summer. I was going to say, did you go for both summer and winter? Yeah, every summer we'd go out, and then every winter we'd try to go out to snowboard usually. So. 355? Disneyland. Okay. This is, uh, I don't know how many times we went to Disneyland. Not very many, but this was, I guess, where they got their ears. So. All right. And... If we could publish 392, please. That's a video. Uh, before you publish it, would you approach, please, for just a minute? Yes. You may proceed, Ms. Brady. Thank you. Before we publish it, I'm told that if we turn the volume down a little bit. Great. Can you tell the jury uh, what they watched in 392, please? Yeah, that looked like a couple of different clips. Uh, one of them was a trip to Ventura where Jimmy and I were out in the surf. He was on a boogie board. And then the second one, I think, was the Monterey Bay Aquarium gift shop. So I think that's uh, with uh, Jim sitting on the little seal there. Okay. So. And were those two other examples of things you guys did together yeah. as a family? Yeah, that's right. Uh, you also uh, mentioned camping? Uh, yes, we had a tent trailer for quite a while, and so we do lots of camping trips with that. Actually, we started with tent trailer and then moved. We started with tent camping and then moved to tent trailers. Your Honor, if I can approach with D-TR-356 through 60. Yes. <coughs> I've had the opportunity to review 356 through 360. Thank you, Ms. Brady. And I have no objection to them being admitted or published. Okay, thank you. Without objection, D-TR-356 through 360 are admitted and may be published. If we can put up 356, please. Um, yeah, that's Jimmy and I uh, camping, I think, at Dos Picos. And... Uh, this is an early one because we have my, that's actually my parents' ancient canvas dome tent. All right. And 357? Yeah, that's a, we, um, the guy on the ra left is uh, Ron Iwamiya, who's a good friend of mine. And uh, we did 
several, maybe about a dozen camping trips with he and his family. And so in this picture, I think we're, we're somewhere up in the eastern Sierras. Um, we'd either go, um, let's see, to the, I don't know, up above Bishop, California. You guys in Colorado probably don't know that area. But anyway, it's sort of, it's a lot like the Colorado high country. And we'd go up there and uh, do trout fishing and camping. And uh, we had a good time because he had, he had a young daughter younger than, uh, than Jimmy. And so that's his daughter. I think it's, her name is Cammie. So, so we, did, that, we did a bunch of camping trips. So that's your friend and, and his That's his daughter. tent trailer. We had, a, we had a similar one. So. And then you and uh, James on the right side of the Yeah, picture. that's Jim, Jimmy and I worked up. So. 358, please. Yep, that's another one of Ron and his, and his daughter and then Jimmy just kind of sitting around the, the campsite. 359? Um, that's uh, Jim and Cammie down near the, a lake. You know, I'm not sure which lake that one is. Uh, well, how did James do uh, interacting? With uh, he was good. The kids liked him, right? They pestered him a lot, but he was pretty patient. Mr. Holmes, yes. if you can, you should wait until the question is completed uh, oh, okay. before you answer, okay? Okay. All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, 360, please. And tell us about this picture. Um, this one was taken at, at James Egan, Uncle Dexter's house. He had a little pond on his property, and so he would uh, let the kids fish. I think it was catch and release. Okay. So. Let's, uh, let's move on and talk about, uh, about high school a little bit more. Uh, I can't remember if I already asked you this. I apologize if I can't. I have. How, how did James do in high school um, academically? Uh, academically, he continued to do very well. And did he eventually make plans to attend college? Yes, he did. All right. And did he graduate from Westview High School? Yes, he did. Your Honor, if I can approach with D-TR-361 through 368, please. Yes. I've had the opportunity to review 361 through 368. I have no objection to their admission or publication. All right, thank you. D-TR-361 through 368 inclusive are admitted without objection and may be published. We could start with 361, please. What is that, Mr. Holmes? That's a picture taken from in front of Westview High School and at, during Jimmy's graduation. Is graduation day? Yep. And uh, from left to right? Uh, left is Arlene, then Chris, then Jimmy, then me. Uh, 362? Um, that's Jimmy and I also in the parking lot of Westview getting ready. I guess we, he's already gotten his diploma, so uh, probably how, after. How did you feel uh, when he graduated from high school? Yeah, it's good. It's a milestone achievement. 363? Uh, we baked him a cake. Oh, sorry. <laughs> What's this picture show? Uh, yeah, this is graduation cake. All right. Did family attend? And uh, Yes. Um, I think you can barely see her, but I think that's Aunt Terry, um, Dexter's wife in the background. And so, yeah, there was a whole group um, that showed up for the... 366? Him in his cap and gown? Correct. Right. 367? What is that? That's his uh, graduation photo, or his yearbook photo. The one that went in the yearbook? Mm -hmm. Yes. 368? Um, this one... Oh. It, what, go ahead, Mr. Holmes. What is this show? Um, this was a, a ceremony they had at Westview for, I guess, people who got scholarships. And so Jimmy got a... 
a region scholarship to Riverside. So, all right, we can take that down. Uh, so he, James got accepted at University uh, of California at Riverside. Um, how how was he doing around that? How was he acting? Um, how did he seem around that time period when he graduated high school and was headed to college? He seemed fairly typical. I mean, at that at that time, maybe in hindsight, we could think maybe he was getting gradually worse. But I, there was really not a huge. There certainly wasn't any kind of noticeable change in okay. his, you know, sociability or demeanor. And how was it? How was it the same as far as his sociability or yeah, demeanor? He had, I think he had a few friends that he hung out with, um, but generally socially he seemed still pretty isolated. Um, and, but he was still doing well at school and still participating in sports. So. And uh, were you... At this age, were you concerned at all about his sort of isolation and um, um, not perversion? Really. I, I, not really. I'm sorry. To, That's I'm okay. Stopping, yeah. um, not really. I was, I was kind of the same way. I mean, I don't know. In some sense, his path kind of was very similar to mine. And so he, since you saw sort of yourself in him, did that sort of ease any concern that you might have about how quiet? Not, that's correct. Okay. At this point, um, did he have a lot of friends over to the house? No, still almost none. Any girlfriends that he brought home? No. Okay. Did you uh, help him move when he moved to uh, Riverside for school? Yes, we, we took a big load. And I guess he had move-in day for freshmen to the dorm. And, so. and mm -hmm. he was moving into the dorm? Yes. Your Honor, if I can approach with D-TR-369 and 370. You may. the opportunity to review 369 and 370. I have no objection to their admission or their publication. Thank you. Thank you. With that objection then, both are admitted and may be published. If we can publish 369, please. And what is this a picture of, Mr. Holmes? Uh, this is a picture of Jimmy's, uh, Jimmy's dorm room at Riverside, and I think it's on move-in day. Right, and is that you? Yeah, that's uh, Jimmy and uh, and me sitting at the computer. And 370? What is that? That's his uh, diploma from uh, UC Riverside, neuroscience with high earners. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How often do you, did you have contact uh, with your son while he attended college at Riverside? Um... Not very often. I mean, I think we we tended not to talk all that much. We we would certainly see him on holidays and probably um, try to call him. He wasn't really a phone person, I guess. Uh, that's the way I would put it. So he didn't particularly care to talk on the phone. So I found it easier to reach him by email and just kind of ping him every once in a while to find out how he's doing, make sure everything's going okay. Was this a new thing about him not liking to speak on the phone, or had he always been like that? As far as I can remember, he'd always been like that. Okay. And so mainly you kept in touch with him through email? Yeah, email, or we'd possibly arrange a phone call if we wanted to make sure we could get a hold of him. All right. How did he do academically, academically at Riverside? I think he did well. Did you know much about uh, his social life at Riverside? Um, not too much. We went to one event, like a homecoming or something. I'm trying to remember. There, there was only one or maybe two times we went up there. Um, and so, so we really didn't know what he was doing socially. Did he ever bring any friends home, uh, college roommates or friends he met in college? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I know he, Earl and Richie, I guess his high school friends that went there, I think they would still get together down in San Diego. 
Did you meet anyone new from uh, Riverside? No. Well, except when, in move-in day, we met Dale, his roommate, and he seemed nice. Any uh, girlfriends that he introduced you to during college? No. Okay. After he uh, graduated from Riverside, uh, what, what did he do next? Um, then he was applying for graduate school. And so at that point, I guess he submitted, uh, I don't know, something like five or six applications. And the ones he submitted were to like these... Uh, the really top schools in neuroscience. And, you know, he didn't, at that point, he didn't have any kind of like safety school, sort of a mid or upper mid tier. He was just applying to these sort of like the best schools in the country. And it turned out they all have pretty rigorous admission and they have very small um, numbers of people that they accept. So, did he yeah. get accepted in they, any of those? Yeah, it wound up he didn't get accepted to any of them. And how did he seem to react uh, when he did not get accepted at any of those schools? Yeah, I think he was disappointed. Right. What did he do since he didn't get into graduate school? What, what occurred next with him? Uh, basically, he did nothing for a while. And um, I guess that went on for a, a few months. Um, and then... Where was he living? He was just living at home. He had moved back in. And what would he do during the days? I'm trying to remember whether he went to the Y at that time, but he'd certainly be playing video games, and uh, he'd stay up late. I guess he kept to his sort of college schedule, which, which meant during the weekday I didn't see him a lot, right? I'd usually be gone, and then we'd have dinner. I think we'd usually have dinner together. D did friends come over to see him? Nope. Did you know of him to go out with friends during that time? I didn't, no. Well, occasionally, actually. They would sometimes go to movies, I think. So, But not very often? Yeah, not very often. Uh, what, what happened next? Well, then uh, Arlene suggested that he get a job or, or move out. Uh -huh. And uh, so he went and got a job. Where and, did he get a job? A uh, pill factory. That's really how I know it. Um, so it was some place that made vitamin pills and stuff like that. And so I think we'd heard testimony about it. Uh, so, But anyway, so he got a job at this pill factory working swing shift. Um, so at that point, we saw him even less because he was usually, let's see, in the morning he was sleeping, in the afternoon and evening he was gone. And so we were on like almost orthogonal schedules. So. When, when you would see him, how did his mood seem to you? I guess it was okay. I mean, uh, uh, he's, he didn't seem to mind working at the pill factory. So. Right. Did he ever, did he seem happy, sad? No, that was, well, that was one of my worries about him in general, is it didn't seem like he was happy. So that was, if I, if I had a major worry during that time, it was more that he didn't seem like he was happy. He didn't necessarily seem depressed to me, but he didn't seem happy. Right. Did he uh, do another round of applications for graduate school? Yes, he did. Can you tell the jury about that, please? I don't know too much about it, other than he, he considered some different schools, um, still pretty good schools. I mean, he, he was going for good neuroscience programs because he wanted to go to kind of a highly rated one. And so he, felt he did like six or eight, I'm not even sure. So he did all the application process himself, and I never, I didn't help him with them or anything. And so, but he went ahead and applied in a second round. And did he get accepted at any of those schools? Yeah, my understanding is, I guess he got a, um, a second interview at, at Iowa, and, but that one didn't, he didn't get accepted. And then what was it, Colorado? Illinois, and uh, I don't remember which other. I thought there was another one. That... All right. So he did this round of second interviews where he had to fly out to the school and spend a couple of days there. All right. And uh, did he eventually uh, decide to go to school uh, in Denver? Yes. Um, how... Uh, was there anything that precipitated him making this second round of applications? Um, I think he wanted to go to grad school and he wanted to study neuroscience. And so, 
Did, did you and Arlene encourage him to do that? Uh, yes, I did. To, to make the second round of applications? Yes. Okay. I don't know that he needed much encouragement, though, because I think he did want to go on in neuroscience. All right. And he ended up at uh, UC Denver. Correct. And um, how did he seem when he was about ready to move to Colorado? He was looking forward to it. All right. Did you help him move to Denver? Um, no, the way it worked out is I think he um, hopped in his car and, and went to Denver by himself. And then we, we came later and brought his snowboard and some other stuff that he wanted. So. When you came, had school started? Uh, no, I think it was still in, it was May. So um, I think he might have started working at, at these lab rotations that he was doing. And so that, that may have just been starting, um, but school official classes hadn't started yet. And so this would have been May in 2011? Yes. Okay. Right when he got to the school? Right. Okay. How many times do you think you saw him, um, let's talk about 2011, um, May through December. Uh, do you know approximately how many times you saw him? While he was in Denver? I'm trying to remember whether we saw him at Thanksgiving or not. That I actually don't remember. I know we saw him in December. Okay. So for Christmas break. How did he seem um, in December of 2011? In December he was really sick. Uh, can you tell the jury about that? Yeah, he just really looked sick and weak. And he didn't seem to be doing very well at all. And um, so we... We took him over to Kaiser, and I guess the doctor checked him out and determined he had mono. And I don't know too much else about what the doctor gave him. The doctor prescribed stuff for him. And for the mono? Yeah, I guess for the mono. Okay. And I'm not even sure what he talked to the doctor about. And, and the doctors uh, don't tell us. I'm sorry. By the time, by the time he <clears throat> went back to school in January, how was he seeming at that point? Um, I think he was he was a little better. It seemed like most of December he spent kind of sleeping and resting, even though um, we had we drove over to see uh, his uncle Dex and his aunt. You know, I guess his uncle Dex because Aunt T might have been gone by then. So, sorry, I didn't oh yeah, we went over. Um, we drove over to see his uncle Dexter, and his aunt had already passed away by then. Did you have much contact with James uh, from January until July of 2012? Um, not much, just emails, and I guess we talked to him at least once, you know, so. Did you begin to become concerned about him in the spring of 2012? Um, yes, we knew he had broken up with his girlfriend, and I guess we also knew the way he put it was the professor in his second lab got peeved, as I think that was the expression Jim used. And so we knew some things weren't going very well there. Right. And were you speaking to him on the phone during this time to get this information? No, it was mostly email. Okay. Uh, you did uh, speak to him, though, uh, on 4th of July, 2012? Um, yes, we did. Can you tell the jury how James seemed when you spoke to him on the phone? First of um, all, did you have to arrange that, or how was it that you had a yeah, phone call? Yeah, I think we call? did set, set it up by email, as I recall, or some, some either text or email, I'm not even sure which. Um, but we did set up a phone call for around the 4th of July. And, uh, and so we talked to him then, and historically, when, uh, when we talk to him on the phone, we get uh, yes or no answers, and you know, little content. Uh, so, but this time it was quite different. We were concerned that he, because at that point we knew um, he was dropping out of school. And he, I think he had sent an email stating the fact that he was, he was not going to continue at school. And, and, and had you also heard from Dr. Fenton by that point? She, yes, she had called, I think, in June, June 11th. Tell, uh, tell the jury about that first. Um, yeah, she called... Arlene, and my second-hand understanding of the situation was she had called to let us know that he was dropping out of school, but didn't really provide 
any more information. He was seeing that he was seeing a psychiatrist or had seen one, so and was and was planning to drop out of school. And we didn't know he had he was see, had seen a psychiatrist at all, and we didn't know he was dropping out of school. But that's all she was able to tell us. And I kind of personally put it down to HIPAA type stuff. I know there's these privacy laws that she wasn't, she didn't tell us much. And that's part of what motivated us to get on a call with Jim just to find out what's going on. But she also mentioned that the Jim had not given her permission to talk to us. Okay. So the other part of it is we've got to be able to talk with him I guess without letting him know that we knew he was seeing a psychiatrist. I, know, yeah. I don't know how that sounds, but anyway, that's that was what I was thinking about all this. Um, but anyway, so after let, after let, this, let me ask yeah. you a question real quick. After you heard from Dr. Fenton, did did that uh, sort of elevate your level of concern about James? Of course. And yeah. and what were you thinking at that point about about James? Well, I I thought it would be really natural for him to be very depressed. I mean. I know he wanted graduate school. We knew he, we knew he didn't feel this was a good fit, so we wanted to kind of make sure he wasn't too depressed about it and would be able to kind of move on from that. And uh, did you guys try and get back in touch with Dr. Fenton? Yeah, I sent her. Um, Early and I talked about it, and I'd been reading in in Yahoo um, about Asperger's. Okay, and I thought, well, okay, that. To me, it seemed to fit, you know, kind of social difficulties, but still decent academically. I, so we, uh, Arlene, I told Arlene that we should call her back and, and say maybe he's got Asperger's or something. Did and you, so, did, yeah. did my you or Arlene ever speak to Dr. Fenton again? My understanding is Arlene left a voicemail and never heard from Dr. Fenton. Okay. So we had the, the one call with Dr. Fenton and that was it. Okay, and then you were going to tell the jury about the July 4th phone call. Yeah, we had a, we had a, so we did finally talk to Jim, and in July 4th, I mean, my main, my main goal was to find out, is he really depressed? Because I, I think I'd, I'd sent him an email recommending that he gets counseling. I was just hoping that that would sort of, if he was going to see a, a shrink, he would keep going. And so, um, but anyway, so on the 4th of July, we wanted to sort of see, because I mean, our, we were thinking about flying out on the 4th of July. And so we we called him, and we had what for us turned out to be a really long conversation. And so... Was that usual or unusual? Yeah, that's what I was saying. It, was, it wasn't unusual, but he did, sure didn't sound depressed. Um, he was pretty chatty, and so it's like he was talking. And so, so he was talking quite a bit, and, you know, and he didn't seem depressed, and... You know, he certainly seemed he did seem to be making sense and everything, so it wasn't that kind of chatty. But anyway, so so we had a talk, and so at that point, I think we were telling him, you know, we were going to arrange to come out and see him, because I think I'd already told my boss, you know, I worried about our kid. We probably got to make plans to see him, and so it was somewhere in that time. Um, so. All right. Um. Given the sort of history uh, with James on the phone, did his chattiness and willingness to talk a lot strike you as odd for the way he usually is? Yeah, it was unusual, but it wasn't it wasn't alarming. Okay. Uh, okay. So, right. I mean, he usually didn't talk that much, and so that was that was kind of surprising but i was i was looking for clues of depression which would be kind of i thought even even less talking mm -hmm. so when you um during the the spring of of 2012 were you calling him and leaving messages trying to get in touch with him um yeah we, and uh was was he returning those calls or no um no, but he would sometimes answer emails, so it's not like we were having no contact, but we were finding it hard to kind of have phone contact with him. Your Honor, if I can uh, approach with D-TR-393, 394, 395, 396. Yes. Mr. 
Mr. Holmes, have you seen those discs before? Um, yes, I listened to them uh, a couple days ago. And uh, what is on each one of those discs? Uh, most of them are just short voicemails of my calling him, asking him how he's doing, asking him if he needs anything. And so are these examples of your attempts during the spring of 2012 to try and get in touch with, with James? Yes. Your Honor, if, uh, I would move for the admission and publication of 393 through 396, please. Uh, based on the previous record, uh, D-TR-393 through 396 are admitted, um, and that's inclusive. 393 through 396 inclusive are admitted and may be published. Thank you. If we can start with 393, please. Hi, Jan. This is Dan. We're just calling to see how you're doing. It's kind of Sunday, uh, Sunday afternoon, 5 here. I guess it's like 7 your time, or, or is it 6? I'm not even sure. Anyway, everything's fine here. We're just calling to see how you're doing and uh, find out if you need anything. Um, okay. Uh, not too much else. Arlene, did you have anything else you wanted to ask? Love you. Ah, Arlene says love you. Yeah, we love you too, and so take care. And uh, hope everything's going fine. Give us a buzz or send us an email. Okay? Okay, take care, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. If we can publish 394, please. Hey, Jim, this is Dad. I was just uh, calling to find out uh, how you're doing. Uh, nothing special going on here. It's cloudy, and uh, we're just thinking of you. Okay, so I hope everything's going good. Uh, drop us a line if you like. Send us an email or a call. Anyway, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. 395, please. Hey, Jimmy, it's Dad. I'm just calling around, uh, I guess, 3 o'clock your time, 1 o'clock our time on Memorial Day. Just to find out uh, how you're doing. You're probably out and about, or maybe going to a Memorial Day barbecue or something. Anyway, uh, nothing special to report. Uh, everything's fine here, and so I guess uh, just wanted to call and say hi. Anyway, you take care, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye. And 396, please. Hi, Jim. This is Dad. I was just calling to find out how everything's going there. Uh, we kind of miss you here, and we're hoping to sort of stay in touch. We haven't heard too much from you recently. Um, if you get a chance, uh, give us a call, um, and we'll, you know, like to sort of touch base with you and see how everything's going, okay? Anyway, you take care, and, uh, and we love you, and just give us a call um, when you get a chance, okay? I'll try to call or email you uh, sometime soon just to see see how the things go on. Okay, take care. Bye bye. To Dad. Okay. Would council approach for just a moment, please? Yes, sir. Brady, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holmes, one of those voicemails, uh, you, you referenced Memorial Day. Um, so that would have been in late May of, of 2012. Um, are there dates connected to the other three voicemails? Uh, yes, there are. Can you just read them off for the jury, please? I'm sure. Uh, the first voicemail was April 1st. Um, the second voicemail was April 29th. The third voicemail was Memorial Day, which is May something or other, and so, so end of May. Late May. Uh, yeah. 
And then uh, the last one is June 12th. Now, as you're leaving those voicemails you express to, uh, to James, you're a little concerned because you haven't heard from him. Is that true that you had not heard from him much and uh, were a little bit worried about that? Yes. Yes, that's true. Did you, were you planning on, on going out to see him and check up on him? We were planning, yes. I mean, definitely after, he, after we knew he wasn't going to continue in grad school, we were definitely going. And I would say we would probably go anyway, um, just to visit him. As you were leaving those voicemails, did you have any idea um, what James was doing during that time? Uh, no. And, and you've heard the testimony about what he was doing during that time. Yes. Did you have even an inkling that any of that was going on? No, it didn't even cross my mind. If, um, if Dr. Fenton had told you uh, how sick Mr. Holmes was, would you have done something to try and help your son? Sustained. When you, uh, when you had last seen James, which was in uh, December of 2011, um, did you see him make any facial expressions that you thought were unfamiliar? Um, yes, I, I did notice a couple of things. Um, one is he had, we were just kind of standing around and I did notice a, kind of an odd facial expression, which a later picture of his kind of reminded me of it. And if I can approach with D-TR-371. You may. Mr. Holmes, is that uh, sort of the expression that you thought you saw for the first time around December of 2011? Yeah, it could be interpreted as kind of a smile or a grimace or, or I wasn't quite sure what it was, or a smirk, I guess, as some people have referred to it. Um, Your Honor, can I move for the admission of 371 and ask that it be shown to the jury? Mr. Brockler, do you have any objection? Yes, you may. May I, may I ask him to play the question? Yes, you may. Sir, a couple questions. Yes. One, you don't know when that particular photograph was taken, and I'm talking about, uh, is it 7, DTR7, you see that, sir? DTR371. I'm sorry, thank you, 371. You don't know when that photograph was taken? I don't know exactly when it was taken, no. And to be clear, the expression that you're describing there that you had seen before, you had seen it in December, is that fair? That's correct. And when you'd seen him in December, you described him as uh, fatigued, and suffering from mono? Yes. Eric, can we approach? Yes.
All right, the objection is over rule D-TR-371 is admitted and may be published. Now, Mr. Holmes, is that the sort of facial expression you were trying to describe? Yeah, that, this, this is a, a picture which reminds me of it. And uh, was in December of 2011, was he also making movements with his face uh, that, that maybe you could describe or show to the jury that you thought he was doing that you had not seen before? Yeah, it was more like this just kind of odd facial expression. I don't know. Like, it's hard to, for me to describe. Okay. And then he also wasn't making very good eye contact. Um, and that was something you noticed even back then? Yeah, it was something I noticed back then. It, and it was part of the thing that reminded me. <clears throat> When we sent that voicemail about Asperger's, it was kind of, that's, that's what got me thinking about stuff like that, okay. you know, facial expressions and lack of eye contact. Mr. Holmes, where were you when you heard about what happened in the theater? Um, Arlene and I were asleep in San Diego. Right, and how did you learn about what happened? Um, we received a phone call from somebody in the media who had said there was a shooting. And, and my first thought, of course, was that Jim had been shot. And so you know, my initial impression was it was probably some gang thing. Um, but then we... Uh, and you thought that Jim was the victim? Yeah. I, I had never, it never didn't occur to me that he would be the shooter. Right. What did you do... Uh with the information that, that he was the shooter? What did you do after learning that? Well, once we found out, uh, um, very shortly thereafter, the media arrived in front of our house, along with the police and the FBI. And, uh, and then basically I just sent an email to work saying I had a family emergency. And then I booked a flight to Denver. All right, you came to Denver? Yes. Have you uh, had an opportunity to see James while he's been in the jail here? Um, a few times. How, how many? Um, I'm thinking three, but um, yeah, I guess. Is, uh, is, is there any reason why you haven't seen him more than three times? Well, we got to see him shortly after the, the shooting while he still had his red hair. And then uh, that one the sheriff arranged. And then from what I understand, we're on a, Jim doesn't allow any visitors. And so, um, and so we hadn't been able to see him for a long time for that. And then every once in a while, we, like we've been making like 12 or something trips here for the trials and the preliminary stuff. And so usually every time we come, we try to make arrangements with the sheriff to see if we can see him. And it doesn't happen very often. When you saw him with the red hair, did he seem like uh, the son that you knew? No, he seemed, he was clearly really messed up. And, you know, his eyes were bulging out, his pupils were dilated. He was able to talk to us, which was good. And he actually told us he loved us, which was good. But I could see, you know, something was really wrong with him. Have you and your wife, have you uh, tried to stay in touch with him um, through other ways besides uh, visiting? Yeah, we, we send letters uh, to him. and uh, But that's all limited, really, because of, because of the trial and the fact that all letters, from what I understand, get released to both the prosecution and the defense. And so that's part of the reason I don't think he's written any letters, and I don't think he's going to until the trial's over. If, uh, if Mr. Assuming Mr. Holmes uh, stays in, in jail or in prison, uh, do you and your wife still intend to try and visit him if he will see you? Um, yes. And will you write him letters? Yes, we will. And will you always do that? Yes. What is your uh, fondest memory of your son? Um, I think he was happiest when he was playing soccer. It was a 
kind of middle aged, you know, young kid. So probably in the Oak Hills time, I think that was probably the happiest time of his life. And probably ours too. Your Honor, can I have just a moment? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. The prosecution might have some questions for you, okay? Sure. Mr. Proctor, do you have cross-examination? All right, you may proceed. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. We have, um, over the last couple of few hours, we've had the opportunity to listen to you talk about the defendant's upbringing, and we've seen, my goodness, many, many pictures of that time. You agree with that? Yes. Now, there are some things I want to talk with you about that help flesh out that total picture that aren't covered in the photographs and in the videos, okay? Okay. Now, there are some hiccups that took place along the way with his upbringing. You'd agree with that? Um, I guess so. And I'll be more specific. Okay. Um, when he was eight, mm -hmm. and that is before you made the move from Salinas. Am I saying that right? It's Sal Salinas. 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 Sorry, Salinas. sir. Thank you. You're thinking of Salida. Yes, sir. I probably am. Okay. Salinas down, back down to San Diego. Your wife took the defendant to a social worker because he had been um, acting out at home. Is that fair? Yes. Part of that acting out was he had been, uh, what we've heard anyway, and you've been sitting here, is mm -hmm. he'd been throwing things. Fair? This is back at Prairie Dog in San Diego. Yeah, he had a sort of a late terrible twos or something, I guess. Well, and sir, forgive yeah. me, I didn't know that he had gone and saw something in his age two down in San Diego. Had he sought treatment? No, not at age two. I was talking about terrible twos as having tantrums or whatever. Oh, so okay. I, guess he was, I guess he did have some tantrums at what age? Eight, seven? Okay. Yes, sir, it's eight in mm -hmm. Salinas. And do you recall that? I mean, do you recall your mom? I'm sorry, your, your uh, wife? Actually, I, I don't. I didn't take him, and Arlene took him, and from what I understand, she didn't seem to get much help out of him. Well, you understand, too, at least from sitting here, if not recollecting it yourself, that one of the issues that uh, you guys had expressed concern about was his lack of socialization, even at age eight. Do you recall that? I don't recall lack of socialization. He seemed to have plenty of friends. That was more the that was more the issue we were worried about later was lack of friends. Do you recall at that time too that your wife and I presume had had conversations with you, but indicated to the social worker that your son showed signs of being introvertive or introvertive behaviors? Do you recall that at age eight? That I don't recall. Okay. There were four times that your wife took the defendant to see this social worker in Salinas. You went to the last one. Do you recall that? Actually, I don't. So. Do you recall that this took place January, February, March, and April of 1996? No, actually, it doesn't really make any impression on me, so I'm sorry. Okay. There was also then this period of time when you had moved back to San Diego that you had testified to. Do you recall that? Yes. What year was that? We moved back to San Diego in 2000. In 2000. And it was uh, in 2001, uh, sometime after that, that, uh, again, your wife took the defendant to see Mel Lipsy. Do you recall that? Actually, we all went. That one I do remember. And you all all went together to all of the, the, I think there was 10 or more sessions. Do you recall that? I think we did. You know. and, and that was generalized family therapy in addition to specific issues related to the defendant? Yeah, I think, I think the reason we went were to help the family get adjusted to the move. And it was more focused, I thought, toward the kids. Because everyone seemed to be having some sort of... Uh, an effect from the move from Salinas down to San Diego. Is that fair? I guess, yes. Even your wife was having some of the effect of moving back down to San Diego. Do you agree with that? 
I thought she was looking forward to moving down. I didn't, yeah. I didn't think she was really struggling with the move. But, but. And then you guys went for about a year, is that fair? We went for uh, quite a few visits. And then you just stopped going? Yes. Presumably because you felt like whatever issues had been resolved. Either that or it didn't seem to be helping anything. Because I, I, I didn't detect that Jim necessarily was becoming better socialized after all that uh, work. So. But the concern alleviated or decided, hey, we can deal with this on our own? I, mean, was I, I think it was more Mel said there's nothing to worry about. Okay. And so um, to be clear then, at least on, on two occasions, when you thought that there was some specific issue related to your son, you guys took some action and went and saw either a social worker or Mel Lipsy, who I think may also have been a family therapist or, a yeah, social or something. Yeah, or something, whatever it was, yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Mm. Now then, y your son had really always been good at school, hadn't he? Yes, he had. That made it a little bit easier, didn't it? In that, um, I mean, if whatever issues he was having socializing when you moved down to San Diego, somewhat it's offset by the fact that he is thriving in the academic setting. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would agree that his, the fact that he didn't um, have academic problems meant we, I had much less concern because I knew that was a kind of red flag for severe problems. And despite that, even as early as high school, you had told us that he enjoyed um, paintball with his friends. Yeah, he did that. And strategy games, video games, right? Definitely. Not unusual for him to spend a good chunk of time playing video games over the course of his high school. Fair? That's true. And again, school um, seemed to be a good fit for him. Fair? Mm -hmm. Yes. And education had been something that you placed importance on, correct? Oh, definitely. In fact, one of the things that I think <coughs> is, is apparent is that you have your PhD, don't you? Yes. And it's something that the defendant's aware of, correct? Yes. And how long have you had your PhD? Years. What it would, and, and forgive me, can I ask 1981. you? 1981. 1981. So throughout the course of his entire life, you have been Robert Holmes' PhD. I guess, yes. In fact, it's the kind of signature block that appears on many of the emails we're going to talk about between you and your son in, in grad school. Is that fair? Oh, yeah, certainly the ones that come out of my work email. Yes. And that's something that you came to know was a goal of the defendants, was that he wanted to be a Ph.D. also. I believe he did. And you believe that because that's what he told you and that's what his conduct told you, fair? Yes, certainly his conduct told me. That's yeah. right. He, he never told you that? I think he wanted to go to graduate school. I wasn't totally sure as to his motivations, right? And I wasn't sure it's necessary that he wanted to get a PhD, but I kind of assumed that. Um, and to, to be clear, in high school, whatever limited friendships he had, he certainly did not ever have a girlfriend that he talked to you about or brought home, fair? Definitely. Did he ever go to prom or homecoming with a girl? Nope. In college, you talked about him going away to Riverside. Uh, you remember that? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? I'm sorry. Yes. Just, just for the nice lady here typing all the words. Yes, um, you'd agree with me that Riverside's less than two hours away from San Diego. Yes. And you didn't see him much over that time at college. Fair? That's, uh, that's fair. In fact, the conversations that you described that you had were largely over emails, correct? Yes. That's and, and that's unchanged all the way through grad school. You'd agree with that, correct? Yes. During the time that he was in college, he succeeded academically? Yes. You were aware of that from him? Um, yes, and the fact that uh, I think Arlene had access to the Riverside website to um, transfer money for expenses. And so we could actually check his grades. Unfortunately, we couldn't do that in Colorado. Understood, understood. And so, um, again, during the time that he's in college, he never once brings home to you a girl. Is that fair? That's true. A, a woman, for that matter, yes? Yes. Never tells you that he's flirting with someone or dating someone? Um, that's true. 
In terms of being through college, you had, actually, I'm sorry, you'd mentioned in high school that he rarely ever brought any friends home. Fair? Yes, that's true. In college, do you ever recall him bringing any friends home from college? I don't think, no, I don't think so. Again, pretty consistent from high school through college. Fair? Yes. He does so well at undergrad that he graduates um, or he's in the honors program. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Th that honors program had requirements that we've heard about where he had to complete community service. Do you recall that? Yes. And it's your understanding that the community service he completed was to do the bus trip that we saw videos of today, correct? Oh, to the Mexican orphanage? Yes, sir. Yes. And that goes back to something else. We also heard from a nice lady today from uh, a church that you and your wife and family had attended. Was that in Salinas or San Diego? Uh, that's in San Diego. And there was a picture of him, I think, doing some sort of raking or, or rocks or uh, weeding, weeding. Do you remember that? Yeah, there was a weeding one, and I think there was a uh, power washing. And we heard, too, that that was the product of him needing to do some community service hours for school. Fair? Yeah. In fact, in terms of uh, attending the church, you largely did that to, uh, you know, to support your wife. No, i come to actually like the church. So. During that period of time? Probably. Okay. And you recall, having sat here through this time, hearing your son say that you guys would have to bribe he and Chris with Taco Bell to get them to go. Oh, that was a, yeah, back in Salinas. Okay. Then he, um, he graduates from Riverside, and he's got these fantastic grades. You'd agree with that? Good grades, yes. From the honors program, yes? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Thank you, sir. I'm, and I'm sorry to keep doing that. It's just she's going to yeah, keep right. typing them Come down. Um, and he applies to nothing but the best of the best schools. Fair? Yes. Did you know he was doing that? Did he tell you that he was applying to just the cream of the crop? No, we did talk about what schools he was applying to. And then, then when I looked him up, I thought, wow, okay. So he had a fair estimation of where he thought his skills and productivity were in relation to those great schools. You'd agree with that? I agree where he wanted to go, yeah. And they all rejected him correct? Oh, that's true. In fact, do you recall if even one of them offered him an interview? No, he didn't get any interviews. And you said that after that happened, he had no plan B school, correct? Well, he didn't do it. He should have had a plan B school when he originally applied, but yes, you're right, he didn't. Yes, sir. So he came home, yeah. correct? Correct. And when he came home, um, had no job, right? True. He seemed to you to be disappointed, is how you described it with Miss Brady. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And so he didn't go out right away and go find a job, fair? No. He didn't start reapplying right away, correct? No. In fact, he ended up sitting around the house and, and playing video games, and you said, I think, sleeping late enough into the morning that you, you barely even saw him. Is that fair? Yeah, he'd stay up late. And that continued until you and or your wife took some sort of action, some intervention yeah. to get him to get a job. Yes, I think that was a couple months. And you said your wife suggested it, but if we were going to be accurate, wouldn't you say it's a little bit more than a suggestion to hold out the prospect of get a job or you won't be living here anymore? Yeah. And, and that's the kind of motivation it took for him to end up applying for that pill factory job, fair? Yes. But what you understand is that he didn't apply for the pill factory job. Instead, he applied for a temp agency position and they found him the pill factory job. Do you recall that? Oh, I didn't know that. But does that sound familiar now that you hear it? Does it sound familiar? Um, actually, I didn't, I didn't know he'd applied to a temp agency, so I knew he was looking for a job. Yes, sir. Okay. And he got that position, and it was the shift that you talked about, and we, we've heard about it from some folks that worked with him. And uh, he would go there and do his job and then come home and sleep during much of the time that you might have had the opportunity to see him. Is that fair? That's fair. And he'd play video games still, correct? I'm sure, yes. You didn't notice him going out and socializing anymore even back then? Yes. And again, none of that struck you as all that unusual from what you'd been seeing over the years before, fair? 
Fair. Then he applies to graduate school. Do you recall that? Yes. And he applies to the ones you described. Uh, Illinois, Iowa, CU. Were there others? Um, I don't remember. So. That's okay. He gets interviews at all three of those. You'd agree with that? I think he did, yeah. And he travels out to those. Yeah, they fly him out and he does a day or two interview. He got offers from uh, Illinois and Colorado. Fair? That's my understanding. And do you recall yes. he says he chooses Colorado because they end up offering him more money than Illinois did. Do you recall that? Yep. He quits the job for the pill factory, correct? Yes. And he comes to move out here to Colorado, right? Right. Okay. Now, during the course of that time that he's out there, you actually came out to visit. You and your wife came out to visit him before he came home for that Christmas 2011. Do you recall that? Yeah, we came out in May. And well, you yeah. drove out. Do you remember that? Yeah, we drove out. And there's a series of emails that have all been admitted into evidence that discuss the different things that you were going to bring for him to help him along while he was out there. Do you recall that? Yes, I recall we probably did send him an email. Well, and you had a car full of stuff to bring to him, correct? That's right. Like a bike? Yes. Yeah, a bike. I guess a snowboard, I'm trying to think. Snowboard. And in fact, there's an exchange in there where um, the defendant asks your wife to bring quarters because the laundry machine takes quarters. Do you recall that? I don't recall that. But that doesn't strike you as all that unusual, though. No. And at that time, by the way, when you leave there, you're convinced that he's into the graduate school program, correct? Yes. In fact, he's so busy, he doesn't really even spend much time with you and your wife while you're out there, having driven all the way out there. Is that fair? Yeah, I don't think we spent too much time. And so you then see him again in December of 2011, correct? Correct. Now, you weren't sure about Thanksgiving, but I want to try to remind you of something, and it's in those emails too. Do you recall that he stayed here in Colorado for Thanksgiving and had Thanksgiving with people he described as his friends from school? Okay, yeah. I is, is that, that would make sense since I don't really recall definitely his being home for Thanksgiving. Okay, thank you. He comes home over Christmas and your recollection that you've described to us is that he seems to you to be uh, fatigued and that he sees the doctor and has mono. Do you recall that? I do recall that. Now you spent some time with him and uh, your daughter Chris and your wife in the car driving to, was it Uncle Dex Dex's? Yeah, Uncle Dexter's. How yep. far away is that? Um, he's in Lake Havasu, Arizona, so it's maybe 300 miles. Okay. Oh, that's a good drive, right? I mean, yeah. that's hours. Yeah, it's drive. hours. Right. And you spend all that time with him. You see him interacting with family members, correct? With Jimmy? Yeah. Yeah, he spent most of his time playing Angry Birds right in the car anyway, so... Um, but again, you come away from that trip back home, and there's nothing there that causes you enough concern to do anything different than you had done with him in the years before. Is that fair? That is fair. In fact, one of the things that was encouraging was that by the time he comes out for Christmas of 2011, you are aware that he has, for the first time ever, a love interest. Yeah, that was good news. Not only was it good news, it was completely unprecedented news. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's his first girlfriend. And he's talking to you about her, correct? He did say he had a girlfriend. They went out hiking. Uh, that's Miss Dada? Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, I think it's Gardy. And by the time that he comes back for Christmas of 2011, they've done far more than gone hiking. And I'm, what I mean is they've, they see each other at each other's apartments. They go out to dinner. They see each other at school. You're aware of these things? Uh, we were not really aware of the... So the extent of their involvement. Forgive me for stepping on your words, sir. Despite this being the first, what we've come to find is the first love relationship that the defendants ever had, he doesn't share with you those kinds of details. Is that fair? Uh, no. So d were you aware that over the course of that Christmas break when he's back with you that they shared a couple texts, maybe a phone call or two? No. He has largely kept to himself for years before grad school, including undergrad. Would you agree with that? With a small group of friends, yes. Right. But I mean, he doesn't keep you and your wife involved in the greater details of his everyday life. You'd agree with that? 
Oh, definitely. He was very responsible, and he really took care of himself. And he didn't share with you a lot of the things that were going on with him, fair? True. Before we move on to the rest of that year, though, I want to ask you, too, that we've seen a lot of pictures here of um, the defendant and his sister who, who testified yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yes. You'd agree that this wasn't the uncharacteristic, blissful relationship between a brother and a five-year younger sister over the course of their entire relationship. You'd agree with that? No. Yeah, I guess I would agree with that. Yeah, they've had ups and downs. Fair? I'm sure. And more than that, as the defendant got older and moved away to college, and then again even to grad school, the relationship between he and his sister became more and more tenuous. You'd agree with that? Distant? I mean, sure. yeah, I agree. I don't think they, they had different circles of friends and they, you know, each were pursuing whatever they were pursuing. It wouldn't surprise you if over the course of the period of time from roughly April of 2011 when the defendant moved out to here and um, well, this shooting spree at the theater that he and your daughter's only contact were in that car and with you over Christmas break. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. In fact, if you look at the emails that have been entered into evidence that cover that whole period of time, you'd agree that he never once asks how she's doing? I'm going to object to foundation. Unless the witness has seen those emails, I don't think he can answer the question. Um, overruled. Sir, you can only answer the question if you know. You can't speculate. So. Ask your question again. Okay. Yeah. Sir, my guess is you've had an opportunity to review some of the emails that you exchanged with your son over the course of that year leading up to this mass shooting. Is that fair? Um, actually, I've lost quite a few of them when I retired from my job. Have you seen the ones where you provided any to review before you came here today to testify? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've seen, I don't know if I've reviewed any emails. Prior to well, here's what we can do. Okay. I'll ask you a question. If your memory is different than what I asked you, we'll go grab those pile of emails and I'll let you take a look at okay. them. Okay. Judge, can we approach, please? Yes. The objection is overruled. Uh, thank you, sir. And, and I want to, I'll re-ask the question. I just want to make sure that I'm clear on what I'm asking you as well okay. so that we all know we're on the same page. Okay. You agree that over the course of the time that the defendant was here at school in Colorado that you uh, exchanged emails back and forth with him over that period of time, correct? Yes, definitely. Yep. And, and by the way, to characterize it more accurately, you're not emailing back and forth on a daily or even weekly basis. You'd agree with that? Oh, yes, yes. And in fact, let's, before we get back to the emails, let me ask you about the calls. You'd agree with something that your uh, 
son had told Dr. Woodcock four days after the shooting, and that was that he'd spoken to you and your wife maybe at most about once a month during the time that he was at grad school. Do you agree with that on average? At most, yeah. So these emails, I'm going to ask you if you recall the content of them. If you don't, I can go and get the exhibit, and I think it's People's uh, TR1227, and give you a chance to uh, take Read a look at it and see, okay. and see if it reminds you. And if it doesn't remind you, you can let us know. But let me start with what I think you'll remember. Okay. In general, over the course of those handful of emails that you sent the defendant over the course of that year plus that he was out here, mm -hmm. you don't recall him ever asking about how his sister is doing, do you? I don't. In fact, what you recall, I'm hopeful that you recall, is that you and your wife were the ones that provided him unsolicited information about how your daughter Chris was doing. You recall that? Yes, I do recall that. And but for that, there would be no exchange of information sought by the defendant or provided by you about your daughter, correct? Correct. And that's not unusual for the kind of relationship that they had at that time in their lives, fair? No, sir, I agree. In fact, some of the emails indicate, in, and I know this, was, this is intended somewhat tongue-in-cheek, you are indicating to him that she is struggling with certain things, like flunking out of school, correct? Yes. And like uh, you and your wife wish that she had lived closer to school instead of... I'm, I'm going to object. Can we approach? Yes.
Uh, the, um, the one of the objections is overruled. The other objection is sustained. And members of the jury, the reason I'm sustaining uh, the one objection is because you might recall that the statements in the email exchanges between this witness and the defendant um, that were made by this witness were introduced for a limited purpose. And the limited purpose was to put the defendant's statements in context so the defendant's statements would be intelligible. This witness's statements in the emails were not introduced for the truth of the matter in the contents of the email. They were not introduced for the truth of the, of the contents. And so um, I'm sustaining the objection for that reason uh, so that um, no questions can be asked about the contents of the statements made by this witness in those emails because those statements were introduced for the limited purpose of putting the defendant's statements in context. Does everyone understand that? And remember, folks, that I've given you the instruction that to the extent that you can consider evidence that was admitted during the trial uh, for a limited purpose, you can only consider it for that limited purpose with one exception, right? The exception is to the extent that evidence was admitted during the trial for the limited purpose of considering the issues raised by the defendant's not, uh, plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, uh, that evidence may be considered for a different limited purpose. And that limited purpose is to prove um, the existence or absence of a mitigating factor. Okay? Everybody understand that? And everyone's nodding their head yes. All right. It's 5 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and, and stop for the day. Um, Mr. Brockler? You know, it's always strong to end on a sustained objection, objection. so uh, uh, it's, it's the way it goes today. <laughs> it's 5 o'clock, so uh, we're going to go ahead and adjourn for the day, and uh, we'll pick up tomorrow with the rest of the cross-examination of Mr. Holmes. Uh, folks, please remember that all my admonishments continue to apply, so you have to comply with all of them. And then remember the order I gave you earlier today. Those of you who are not sick cannot get sick. Uh, use lots of sanitizer. And then those four of you who are sick, you've got to get better. All right? I hope you feel better. I'll see you tomorrow at the usual time, okay? Have a good evening. Thank you. All right, please be seated, everyone. Mr. Holmes, you may resume your seat. Thank you. You can leave those exhibits over here at the, on the table. Thank you. The record should reflect that the jury has exited the courtroom now. Um, it's 5 o'clock, and it occurs to me that uh, we might be able to talk about instructions. I don't know if um, we'll get to the end of the defense's uh, case, mitigation case, tomorrow. Um, the way we're going. I, I don't know how much more um, time Mr. Brockler will need with his cross-examination. I don't know how much redirect there will be with respect to Robert Holmes. And then um, the defense still has um, Arlene Holmes, and um, I don't know how long that's going to take, um, but I suspect it'll take as long at least as Robert Holmes' testimony. And then there are the recordings or the video recorded um, depositions, and there are eight of them, which I think are about two hours, a little longer than that, is that right? So, so approximately two hours. So given all that, do you think, uh, what do you think the chances are that you'll be able to finish tomorrow, uh, even if, or perhaps if we take an hour for lunch instead of the usual hour and a half? I'm close to finishing tomorrow. All right. In that case, then, why don't we, uh, if, if you're okay with it, I would like to talk about instructions today, at least have an initial 
uh, conference about jury instructions, phase two sentencing hearing jury instructions. I don't need all of the lawyers to stay, to stay here, but I need at least one or two, whoever uh, is going to be addressing the instructions to stay here. Uh, I would need to take a, a short break first, give everyone a break, and then uh, we could start. Uh, and we would not stay past six. Six would be the latest that we would stay. So is that okay with everyone? Is that okay with the people, Mr. Yes. Brooklyn? Okay, is that okay with you, Ms. Brady? Yes. Okay, let's take a, about a 10-minute break then, and then we'll get together again and talk about instructions. All right, the court will be in recess. <laughs>